Deep in the heart of the United Kingdom, a passion for basketball is thriving. From the forgotten outdoor course to the pro level, this sport has captured the hearts of a diverse community. It has been described as the fastest growing sport for many years, but despite the popularity, those who love the game face several challenges. We will hear from those who have dedicated their lives to the game and the growth of British basketball. In the fast-paced world of basketball, having a coach can make all the difference. Not only do coaches help young players excel in the game, they also provide a positive environment for them to learn and grow as individuals. My name is Courtney Van Best, and I'm a basketball coach at the John Rowan Academy. My personal experiences definitely led me, definitely led me onto coaching. Anyway, I'd picked up coaching um, when I was in college. Uh, it was part of the course I was doing and I really enjoyed it because I like to like, teaching young kids how to play basketball. I used to do like a lot of primary school basketball as part of my course and to get like my portfolio up, etc. And that was great for me. But I also knew I had like a lot of experience to pass on. Uh, the opportunity to, to start an academy, which I have now, was given to me by a close friend, um, Ashley Thomas, who'd run basketball in Greenwich for, I think, four or five years at the time. Um, and he wanted to start an academy, he knew I was available, so he brought me on board and I've run it ever since and it's been great. Like I said, I get to pass on some of my wisdom, some of my knowledge, my know-how. Um, I help a lot of kids develop and compete. I've helped get some kids to America and into Europe in my time. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely played a part and I just think for me, I think where I didn't necessarily make it to the heights that I wanted to, for me, if I could give back and help someone else do it, then why not? So I think the biggest challenge for young players in the UK is actually probably just finding somewhere to play. Where they fit in, uh, where they can compete regularly, be trained regularly. Um, I think as an aside, the level of coaching you're going to come across, again, it fluctuates. Um, you can come across some really good coaches that understand the game and want to develop, and some not so great coaches that just want to win. They're going to put a squad together that look like they'll win and, and you know, put them on the court. So for a player to know which team is best for them is, is really tricky. You know, some players are inclined to lean towards the teams that win, but if you're not good enough to play on that team, it just means you're on a team watching everybody else play. Uh, or versus going to the team that isn't as good, where you're going to develop, but you're not going to win very much. And it's, it's, it's really hard to find that balance, I think, for a lot of young kids. So as an academy coach, for me, I think first and foremost is player development. It's greatly underappreciated in this country, I think. There's a lot of, I'm going to take a player and literally utilise them for what they can do now and then what they do after that's entirely up to them. That's kind of how my career was when I was young. So I was, I was under 14, I was six foot one already. Um, so I was literally like a prototypical big man under 14s. Like rebound, block shots, you know. And it was fine, like that, that was my role, but I, I kind of knew within myself, like if I was gonna go further in life, I wasn't gonna be a six foot big man. And I picked that up quite early, to be fair. I went from being like a post player at under 16s to really just being a guard or the, the potential to be a guard at under 18, um, so I had to do a lot of work quickly. I don't know how much that is now. I think, there's, I think with a younger cohort of coaches through the country, I think they, they really realise now, we're, unless you've got a seven footer at whatever age, that player is probably going to be like a perimeter type player and, and needs a certain level of skill to be able to play. Um, I think when I started playing basketball, it was still pretty quite old school in the sense that you have your centre, you have your guard and, and you know. So for me it is, it's just developing those skills within players to understand that if they can do the basics, they'll dribble left, dribble right, shoot the ball, make a layup, play some defence. You can have a career anywhere, as long as you put the work into it. And then, yeah, just life skills. How hard you work, uh, your consistency, um, determination, focus, you know, all those kind of things that you can apply to anything. Um, and if you can apply them in the game, you'll win. If you can apply them in life, you'll probably win as well. Having a coach is critical to human development, you know. It's not about a sport. It's about having someone who can show you right from wrong and explain to you why that is. Having someone that can put you in a situation and teach you the lesson in it, rather than just looking at the result, you know? Understand the process of what's going on around you. We all have coaches, man. We all have coaches. Having it in basketball for me changed my life. For other people, it may be just having someone to listen to. Having someone that is knowledgeable of the field and can guide you uh, when it gets dark or when it's murky. Um, so yeah, ha having a coach is key to being successful. So I've currently got a handful of, of boys that have gone to play basketball in the States. 
James Ababa is currently playing NAIA basketball uh, in California. Samuel Alotu uh, was playing junior college, also in the state of California. Uh, Sil Osajivbe is currently playing junior college in Auburn. So Farouk Balarabi is currently playing basketball in Canada um, at Western Canada Prep. And then James Miller had the opportunity to play like academy level prep school basketball. Uh, but due to the pandemic, actually lost out on his opportunity. Um, so he's looking for an opportunity now. So James is currently playing in Division 2 here uh, for the Greenwich Titans. Uh, just kind of like owning his skills, getting better, developing, and just waiting for his moment, really. My name is James Miller and I play for Greenwich Titans. I definitely would say that going to John Rohn um, revived, kind of revived or pushed forward my career in basketball. I had an amazing opportunity to go to the States, Rhode Island, to play basketball in America. Uh, things didn't work out because of the coronavirus pandemic. So I came back and now I'm playing Division II men's with the Greenwich Titans and I plan to go back to America after the end of the season. There's so many things in the game of basketball that you can take into, into life. You know, learning how to deal with adversity. You know, sometimes, you know, things don't go your way, even when you feel like you deserve it. Also, like, my confidence as well. It's a very egotistical sport. You know, the best players really have to believe in themselves and kind of be a bit delusional. Even if they're not the best, they believe they are. But I believe that it's helped raise my confidence as well, just in everything I do. Like everything I walk into, I always walk into it saying, you know, I'm going to do this to the best of my abilities and whatever happens in the end, you know, it will be. One of the things that I particularly like about, about basketball in general, in terms of a kind of leadership skills and other type of skill sets, such as uh, kind of teamwork, quick decision making, it's really great. But one of the best things about basketball, um, and particularly this is something that I've heard from British ballers the most, um, is just that it is really the escape. Like it's something that allows an individual to get out of whatever issues or struggles or problems they might have outside the court. And as soon as they come onto the court, that's it, that's their focus. So I think that basketball, as well as teaching you about all these different assets, it's also about just helping you relax, just be yourself. And that's one of the greatest things about basketball. Basketball has definitely been an outlet for me. You know, there's times when you don't even really want to talk to anyone, you don't want to talk to another human. Like, you just want to go and play or you just want to go and shoot. Just, it's like a therapy. You're able to clear your mind. You know, when the ball is bouncing and when you're playing, your mind is so clear and everything is just so tranquil and peaceful. Like. You don't think about the worries of your life, like none of that's in your head. It's literally just you and the ball and you're focusing on what you're doing. I think it's been very important to me, uh, to my mental health as well, and to just help me be a, a better person and to clear my mind. I'm in lots and I'm doing up trips. Tell the boss man I just came from the club, so all I really need is chips. Like, crazy no beat, no skips. No skips, but I'm doing up crisp. No crisp, but I'm doing up chip when I grind this weed and it goes in the bridge. Yo, look. What's this sister right there with the guys? Big my bill, man, make it with friends. Doing up fit when I'm doing up nice. I'm all back, you can see it in my eyes. I'm the king when I can't so heavy. Call me creep when the car man's ready. Trying to make five like it's nice with Freddy. Still shaking, why you talking about steady? Look. The back of the ride and the flip I am And y'all just want this digger I heard that I'm next up like digger I am. So when I give banks my filler Look, bouncing the beat like digger Been taking them L's still winner. still winner No curves, so I'm chasing a figure And this thing I'm a Delta They say I did that and they say I did this With the niggas that rap you, the niggas that miss I'm bringing it back to the... I do believe that UK talent is overlooked I think there's a lot of underrated players That are extremely good at the game But because they don't have the quote unquote clout or they don't have the recognition from other people, they are overlooked. Um, I don't say that to be like salty or anything. I just do think that there needs to be a kind of platform or a resource where they can look into guys who are maybe not that out there and they're not that exposed and they can kind of show that there's guys here that are really hooping for real. The main platform for you know, basketball highlights and all that kind of stuff here is a Hoops Fix. So, you know, if you get featured on Hoops Fix, it's like you've got your fame for like a couple of weeks or something, a couple of highlights on there. It means 
love something, you, you work at it differently. And I think there's so many individuals here that love basketball that don't get the opportunity to pursue it the right way. You know, I, I see people that have just natural ability. Their talent is not fully captured or their abilities aren't fully optimized. 1,000% I believe I have been overlooked. Um, there were so many, <laughs> there were so many guys that I saw like in positions in the basketball community that I had given the absolute business to. And I actually have like video footage to show that they could not guard me. But um, yeah, man, that's just how it works. And just because that happened, you shouldn't like dwell on it and be salty or kind of be bitter because of that. Like it happens to everyone. So if you just keep working, you're gonna get to where you wanna be anyway. So the comparison of basketball programs in the US to the programs in the UK is, is quite clear to me. It's the requirement first and foremost financially is, I wouldn't say minimal, but it's a lot less than it would be in the UK uh, because a lot of programs are run out of schools, which you have open access to. I think there was a statistic that says for every 60 minutes, a European basketball player trains, an American player is playing a game. And that's a big difference because you're getting game experience, you know, every other day uh, from a young age. They play basketball kind of all year round with tournaments and the AAU and, and all those kind of like camp circuits, etc. Training here in the UK compared to programs in the US, from, from my personal experience and what, I, what I've went through, is night and day. Um, I'm used to training six days a week, playing two games a week, um, morning lifts stretching with the team, film sessions, all that. My situation here in the UK was, you know, I'm practicing three times a week for a total of maybe five hours, playing 10 games over a span of three, four months. Um, and I'm, I'm begging and fighting to just get some gym time to work on my craft. My name is Russell Garapi III. I'm from Albion, Pennsylvania, and I'm a basketball scholar at Bournemouth University. I decided to come to the UK to play ball because, you know, I wanted to keep the dream alive of playing pro. And this opportunity given to me through Play Overseas program allowed me to get that degree while still keeping the dream alive and experiencing, you know, the world outside of my hometown. Before I came, I did not know about basketball in the UK. I mean, I've heard of British players here and there, um, but in general, you know, it's not a country that you think of for basketball per se. The biggest culture shock for me was that no one cared, like, no one cared I played ball, no one cared that this is who I was and, and you know, how I spend my time. In the U.S., basketball is such a big sport. It's one of the, you know, basketball, football, baseball, those are your big three. And um, people know you, you know. I, I came from a small uni, but everyone there knew who I was, and, you know, there's a lot of amenities that come with that. And coming here, you can say you play ball and people won't even bat an eye, you know. <laughs> So it was definitely different, but at the same time, it taught me that if you're gonna play the game, play it because you love it. Don't play it because you want people to look at you or you want people to say this or say that. Just play the game for the right reasons. When you ask me if I think there's a lack of opportunity in the UK, it's hard because you know every, every city, every you know whatever has their own situation. Where I'm from in Bournemouth, there's definitely a lack of opportunity to play basketball. What I've seen in the bigger picture of the UK is yes, there is, there is a lack of opportunity. And I think the reason for that would be people don't understand the benefits. Aren't, it's not just playing a game. Like You can learn how to be a good partner by playing basketball. You can learn how to be you know, a good teammate in your job by playing basketball. You can learn how to love yourself by playing basketball. You know, and I think when you start with the youth and, and get them to understand that this game can change your life if you play it the right way, not because of the game, but because of what you take from it, then, then I think the development will come. And I think as it grows and you continue to get more and more, you know, NBA players like, you know, I think Sohan over in uh, San Antonio, you're going to have kids looking up to him and wanting to be that and follow that lifestyle. And because of the inability to create an environment where they can access those facilities or, you know, train in a gym or have a trainer that knows what he's talking about, you're not, you're, you know, kids are going to struggle. You go outside, you can't just walk and find a basketball court. If you do, it's all caged in 
and there's, there's soccer goals underneath, and there's people kicking, you know, it's just, you don't have the facilities here in the UK to truly optimize people's love of the game. Finding a court in London, in the UK, is very difficult. Court access is one of the biggest detriments to youth basketball. Uh, one of the main reasons is it's expensive as hell. I wanted to go to a court one time during summer, like a school sports hall, and I think they asked me for 65 pounds per hour. And I was like 17 at the time. Well, the price of running out of a court really is ridiculous. Um, and it's been described to me as you pay more for the lighting than anything else. And if you compare it to the standard of the facility you're hiring out, uh, I live close to Woolwich and uh, the Woolwich Waterfront Sports Hall, it, it's, it's just horrible. Like the baskets are falling off. The, you know, it's just all very outdated. The floor is concrete but they charge you £60 an hour to hire it. Um, and I think that's criminal, personally. Having a good basketball court when you want to play basketball is as important as having a reliable car, having clothes that keep you warm, you know, um, having shoes that fit you the right way. It's about safety and the ability to perform, right? If we play on a court that's sliding and slippery, you know, we're one bad cut away from tearing something and our career is forever altered. So of course, like, it's really important to have good facilities. And it's like, if the floor's dirty or it's, it's a concrete floor, like a lot of schools have got the concrete floors, which is horrible. Yeah, it's not great. Um, so those are really important, the facilities above everything else. It just allows you to maintain that consistency within your team. If, you, you know, if, you're, if you've got a court that you've got to share with someone, for example, like a lot, there's a lot of badminton played on basketball courts. If you've got to share your court with badminton, that alone creates a lot of headache um, in terms of like bookings, etc. We have to share a sports hall or a gym with about three to four other sports. Uh, as I said, in America, when you go to a, an LA Fitness, which is a gym, by the way, like for people to work out, there's literally a nice, pristine indoor basketball court next to the gym. In the States, I've never, ever, ever had to share a court with another team. Where I come from in the US, sport teams have priority. And that means that individual bookings don't happen, or if they do happen, it never conflicts with people getting their own work in or teams getting their own work in. I have played at some outdoor courts in the UK, but I mean, only one or two. Um, you know, I, I just didn't think it was that nice, you know? It was just uneven, uneven ground, and you know, the one hoop is 10 foot, one hoop is like, nine, seven, and you know, it's all caged in. It looks like a little prison. Um, you know, your typical outdoor court is just like two hoops, concrete floor. Um, what those hoops are like, I can never tell you. I've seen all sorts, you know, you get the baskets, the actual basketball baskets that like have a chain or like a net or whatever. Some of them are like, I can't even describe it. Like the, what should be the net is just additional metal that is actually more of a hindrance than anything else. It's like a weird metal ring at the bottom of the hoop. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's like, it doesn't actually allow for the basketball to go through the basket. It's really weird. Basketball courts historically around the UK are kind of left a bit untouched and don't have a lot of love and care and attention. Most of all, it's like they just don't have a net. And that is one of the hardest things to, to play on and feel. It's just like, it's, yeah, it's heart-wrenching when you go to a court and there's no net up there. Having outdoor basketball courts is the key to getting young people involved in basketball because it's a game. It's a game that you play. And if you don't have the ability to just play, then you're not going to get into the game, you know? So having, having the ability to just go somewhere and there's a hoop outside and you can grab your buddies and go shoot a ball and air ball 10 times, but you make one and it's the best feeling in the world. That's where the love of the game starts for any kid. There's been a great investment in development over the last two or three years. You're seeing a few courts now really popping up and are looking like something you can be proud of, but I think they're too few and far between. I've seen courts in the UK where, you know, it's, it's beautiful, man. It's, it, you'd go to the US and you'd be like, man, this is, this is a nice court um, out there in London. Uh, I'm Martin Dyan. I run the biggest one-day 3x3 tournament in the UK uh, called the GG 3x3. And I consult on basketball courts and do camps and clinics and everything that's related to basketball and trying to grow the game. 
So I get questioned a lot about which court to go to. There are some really notable courts in the UK. Um, and so one in particular, so there's one in Chelmsford, uh, 3X3 Basketball Court at Richardson University College. Uh, it's a really beautiful show court that I helped build. So obviously I'm gonna mention that first. Uh, the Clapham Common Court, is just has just been renovated, uh, led by Sam Nita at Who's Fix, uh, in partnership with the NBA and Foot Locker. Clapham Common is, is an amazing facility now. It's probably better than most indoor facilities in London. Another court that got renovated recently was Deptford, the Blue Cage Court in Deptford. A massive project, beautiful three full courts outside, flood lit. The courts can be really special for local communities because they uh, bring people together when you've got a new court, something that looks cool, the local community want to be there. You know, they want to be in that location. It engages more people because they want to either go and see it or they want to go and play on it. So you're actually bringing more people to that location. But for the basketball community overall, having a renovated court is super, super special. So we're slowly starting to see this kind of re-emergence and refurbishment of basketball courts. The only issue with these outdoor courts is like sometimes they do require a lot of maintenance. Um, for example, if you're using a certain paint on the course to make it look really cool, after a while that paint, you need to repaint these courts. You know, a backboard and a, and a hoop and a brand new net and a brand new court is great, but what happens when people have been playing on it for a long time? You know, what happens when the net starts wearing down a little bit or it goes? You know, what happens if the backboard isn't the best backboard and some of it cracks? So the renovated courts are only going to be as good as long as they're maintained by the local community or the local authority. Basketball definitely lacks funding. Um, and I think, I don't want to get too political, but I think it lacks funding because of the demographic of players that will play basketball. Um, it's not an elitist sport. As an example, I think like horse riding and, and like rowing get like a tremendous amount of money um, versus basketball that gets maybe like a couple million. Uh, and it's just, it doesn't quite make sense. Um, I can understand the financial implications of riding a horse, but also basketball is actually quite easy to fund in terms of paying for the courts, uh, equipment and officials, etc. some development for kids. Um, and in terms of that, there's just, there's just no development or no, no financial input, should I say, um, at all, really. Basketball in the UK lacks funding. Now, I know in the BBL, they just removed the whole, you know, there's no more salary cap. So basically, owners that have the most money can invest as much as they want into the league. Pro basketball is a business, right? That's the reality. So now that that rule has been removed, you will see investments happening because business owners will understand the profitability that comes from it. Basketball is becoming very popular here. You know, people love the game. Even if they don't know much about it, when they see it, they're very entertained. And so I think with more funding, the level of talent grows, which increases funding, which increases talent. You know, it all, it all starts from that level of people have to be willing and committed from the top to reinvest, whether it be time, whether it be money, whether it be facilities, resources, whatever. People don't always know where to turn to. For example, the governing bodies, we've got Basketball England, Basketball Wales, you know, we've got the British, you know, the, the B British Basketball Federation, the BBF as well. And I think people find it sometimes a bit difficult to know where to turn to if they need to know where their club is or they need to request funding. But also it's difficult for those bodies, on the other hand, to know where to distribute those funds as well because they've got their communities, but they've got clubs that are struggling with financing or funding their own basketball courts. They've got clubs that are struggling to get kits, you know, uh, clubs that, are, that have certain fees that they have to cover in order to get their teams into certain leagues and events. So I think it's difficult from both sides um, in that respect. The funding for the, for the growth of sport is... is it's tantamount for me. I think if you don't have the funding, the sport doesn't grow because you're, again, you're, you're, you're required to have people that, are can, that can self-fund and maybe you do get a group of kids that can self-fund, but they're all, for every kid I would say that can self-fund, there's probably three or four that can't. Uh, and those three or four kids are missing out on the opportunity to be part of the game. The game is, is missing out on the opportunity of having them so their sport doesn't grow. You know, coaches are limited in their, in their resources because they're probably paying for it out of their own pocket. Um, or relying on a school to do so, and school's funds are limited also. To grow a sport, you want pe people to enjoy watching it and people to see it. So in order for people to see it, they need to know about it. So it might just be something like promo, uh, sponsorship deals, simple things like just putting a poster on a bus. When kids look at that, 
They want to be them. The importance of funding and growing a sport is there is no sport without funding. You know, it's like you can't drive a car without gas, you know. Sports cost money and being able to pay players and buy facilities and buy the equipment and, you know, organize events and tournaments and um, it all costs money. But the thing is, the more you invest, the more return you get with sports. One of the greatest privileges that I've experienced is actually being able to put on a tournament or put on some coaching or help renovate a court and then seeing the reaction being part of that. And um, if more people could, um, could do that, you know, like realize how rewarding it is to actually be renovating a court or putting on an event for other people in the community, um, then uh, everyone wins. The basketball community has brought a lot of people together, uh, me included. The people that I'm close to within the game, they're people from all different like walks of life, all different fields. I think it's really good to have that different kind of network of people. Like obviously it's good to have like-minded people who are on the kind of same wavelength as you, on the same path of you, uh, you know, same mindset as well. But you know, when you see another hooper in the UK, there's like a mutual level of respect. Like we all understand what we go through, like we get it. So it's just like you hooper who Obviously, you were here to compete, but there's some mutual respect there with uh, you know, the UK community. That's the one of the best things about basketball, like, without doubt. It doesn't matter where you're from. Uh, it doesn't matter what your background is, uh, your, your race, size, gender, ability, beliefs. It doesn't matter. If you're on the court and you, and you want to play basketball and there's someone else that wants to play basketball, let's go, let's go ahead. So for basketball to really grow, I think funding is like an easy answer. Um, I personally feel like the standard of coaching needs to develop. And that's, that is being critical of myself and others. I think I could definitely be a much better coach. I think if there was a higher level of coaching at the junior level, basketball would just, it would, you know, skyrocket quite quickly um, because there's a hunger for it. The people that are here and are serious about it are hungry, man, and they just go get it. And as a hooper, you, when, you, when you see it, you know it. You need to get people in the right positions that care about the game because they care about the game, not because it can make profit. Once you have those people in the chairs, what needs to happen next is funding needs to be delivered to the lower levels. The BBL will sustain itself, the NBL will sustain itself because the talent level is high. In order for it to grow as a whole entity, you need the youth that don't have the same opportunities or natural skill set to be able to be developed. If you don't take basketball as the opportunity, you've already lost. And so what I mean by that is, if you don't look for avenues of funding yourself, if you don't collaborate with others to try and grow the game or your event or your club, we will never get anywhere. So you have to collaborate. You have to look into your own avenues. You've got to base it on your own experience. You gotta work with family and friends. I kind of have this phrase, which is kind of like, if one rises, we all rise, which is just basically my way of saying, like, if we can help each other in the basketball community, then we're all gonna grow. So there you have it. Where we're from, basketball is not mainstream. But for those who love it, it's more than just a dream. To some it's just a game, but to others an opportunity. Togetherness and unity 
it's what comes with the community. The lack of funding to the lack of support results in our dreams of the being cut short. The odds are against us, but we still train. Our love for the game is what keeps us sane. Dribbling, dunking, stretching the floor. To find a hoop, you have to explore. And when you find one, it won't have a net. But give us that shot, and trust me, it's wet. This is the least of our problems, don't get me started on the weather. We face a lack of funding, but still hoop together. To the town and I grab me some munch It's been three days since so I last day at lunch Craving them peas when I'm fans on a bunch Try my team when he threw me a punch Try my team when I ate her brekkie Uni work and it's coming all techie Whipping S.Y. might come steppy Just touch down and I might link Ellie Might link Clara, might link Bo Large amounts of the cash in the door Coming like river, my bars them flow Been a hot minute so I ain't bun crow Coming like smash, my bars them super Do not chat, you ain't king like Cooper Just chatting that pooper Back so they can't see my future It's been a hot minute so I ain't seen her. Prius face with the largest back in the hips, them coming all curved. curved. Just came back from uni when I hope that I got me a first. Painting got me distracted, and she also gets on my nerves. Yeah. Right. Look, these skinny niggas not test me. Even if I wore myself, I couldn't best me. You made me sour, so zesty. Stop chatting shit, your girl caress me. Girl just caress me. Look, I just kissed my teeth. Wait, no, I just kissed your girl. Oh shit, let me write that wrong. Like my name is Earl, and I told her give me a 12. Looking all bougie. I'm chilling at the back of the motive. But this girl can see right through me. Sue me. She's trying to pursue me. I left, but she thinks she can do me. Yo, why do you think? Hey.